Hello, everyone, and welcome to this radcast of the Solution Club at the beginning of the new world. It is Tuesday, April 28th, 2020. I'm Jamin Chively, your main host. We're all hosts here, um, but I guess I'm kind of your main host today. And we're going to screen share and look at some stuff I've been writing up um, about the big opportunity that's been brewing and that we've been working on with Silish, with Dr. Priya, uh, with John Raymer, with all of us. And man, we had a great meeting on Saturday about it at the Collective Intelligence Block Party this last Friday, Saturday. Uh, Friday really was when we had the bulk of it. But anyway, let me go ahead and screen share. And I will go through what I've been working on here. Let me zoom in. That's a bit much. Let's try it through. Okay. Um, and I'm just going to edit as we go. I'll just make whatever changes or additions. I've been doing a lot of thinking and dreaming and feeling into this thing that we are co creating here. What is this thing? Um, and so I get into that. Uh, and everything I'm writing here, which probably goes on for 15 pages or so, um, is a super rough draft of what may evolve into a complete manifesto called Operation Stone Soup. And it's divided into these sections. Context, naming and what it is, Operation Stone Soup as a can opener, five operational pillars of Operation Stone Soup, what it does, Collective Superintelligence, A New Story for Humanity, Changing the Game, The Press Conference, SRM, The Whole of It, Holism, The iPhone of Global Transformation, that's a metaphor, and then Summary and Conclusion. So there's a lot of stuff here, and we'll just kind of go through it and focus on what's interesting and skip over what's not interesting. And I'm, I'm gonna encourage all of you to please uh, speak up, even if I'm in the middle of a sentence or something, please interrupt. I'm asking you to please interrupt because it's, harder, it's hard for me to keep tabs on everybody when I'm screen sharing. So just jump in. So I'll just read through here so you don't need to worry about reading along or anything. I'll just kind of highlight as I go. So context, in a nutshell, my current view and I'm just starting off with just me writing, and then ultimately we can turn this into a big co-creative uh, effort. But my current view um, is that everything is changing so quickly and radically that even those who are the most committed to sleeping their way through this and basically saying, oh, I'm just gonna wait till we get back to normal, they can scarcely deny it. No one can deny it how quickly things are shifting. Um, and given this, people's minds are open to what's next to a far greater degree than they were even three months ago. People are like, whoa, stuff is changing. Nothing is predictable anymore. What's going on? In parallel, people's minds and hearts are graced with a fear and anxiety about the future, which is now ever present, gnawing and extremely unsettling. I'll go back to screen share just from moment to moment. Are you guys with me? I mean, aren't you all feeling it? I mean, it, it's not something we like to, we, we don't like to, it, it's almost like a weird human thing that part of us like resists. Get into the meat of it, get into the meat of it. Let's get into the meat of it. You want me to get to the meat of it, huh? Yeah, keep on going. All right, let me keep on going. Thank you. It's all about like juicy stuff. Oh, I, not the meat of it. Gosh. Yeah, no, 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 no. The, 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 field, the, field, the, the field roast. Get yeah, to the, get get to the, the field stuff. roast. It's all ah, about God, meat. Not the meat of it. Oh, my goodness. No, no, no. The, the, the field roast. Get to the field roast. I think that's what you're saying, right? All right. And I want to use that animal stuff. You got to take that those analogies out. Yeah, no, no, but I, I get what you're saying. That's why that's why I'm offering a different the heart one. Heart and soul of it. Yeah, get the heart, heart, heart and soul. Okay. Okay. So 
the combination of the preceding two paragraphs, right? The fact that people's minds are open and the fact that people are experiencing a lot of fear, the combination of those two constitutes the single most powerful, most open, most up for grabs vacuum, okay? As regards filling the giant voids now gaping in people's minds of where are we going and what's next? What's the answer, right? Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll get into more of that void in, in the next section. Um, with everything that's going on, we are making some profound mental, psychic, and, and spiritual shifts, which can be boiled down to this. It is now painfully obvious that we have messed up big time in a number of important ways, we as humanity as a whole. The old game has been seriously disrupted, borderline ground to a halt. We know the game is changing. There is absolutely no question about that in anyone's mind, save the most asleep amongst us. Now, who is the we I'm referring to? While maybe half of us know that the game is changing, it's approximately 1% of humanity who are truly awake and truly playing the real game, to quote President Vicente Fox of Mexico in the press conference that he and I co-organized that I played last time on Friday. And in our case, the real game is that of orchestrating trim tab style, and I can talk more about that, but we're basically talking about orchestrating with very fine controls, not big heavy hammer whacking, but very, what a trim tab, um, let me just explain that real quick because it's an important distinction. So, um, you know, like on a giant aircraft carrier, obviously there are rudders that, you know, control the direction where it's going and all that. Well, what controls the rudders, right? There are controls that control the rudders. Well, it turns out there's tiny little rudders on the rudders that are called trim tabs. And it's far more efficient to control the trim tabs with minimal force right? And that can then control this, these giant rudders, which then control the giant ship, right? So we're talking about finding those kind of fine... Jackie! Welcome, Jackie. We're recording, and uh, we're, we're going over the document I sent out last night. Well, it's not a document, but the super long email that I sent out last night with the agenda stuff. So I'll carry on with that. And Jackie, please jump in with any comments or questions, even if I'm in mid-speech. Melvin just did an outstanding example of that. I started to digress and he said, get back on track. I kind of felt like, I sort of like felt his hand swatting my butt or something, but it felt good. It felt good. Anyway, so just jump in anytime. Um, back to the screen share. So, you know, Buckminster Fuller said something to the effect of, don't try to change how people think. Give them a tool which changes them. Um, a tool which, you know, which changes how they think. In our case, the tool is what I'm calling the can opener of OSS, Operation Stone Soup. And with this tool, we open the hearts, minds, and spirits. We open up and connect the physical realm to the spiritual realm in a whole new way. Um, and, you know, I say this is about getting our heads screwed on straight collectively and getting our hearts screwed on straight um, through the use of this new tool of Operation Stone Soup. Um, Basically, listen, the world has just gotten into a bad place. Hey, welcome, Uncle Frank. I hope you can hear us. We're recording. Um, and just like in the story Stone Soup, you know, that community had gotten into a bad place of fear and hoarding and no one was working together. And these three soldiers at the end of World War I or whenever it was came into town and said, hey, let's create Stone Soup. And that, poof, that shifted. Um, that shifted everything. That was the tool in the case of Stone Soup that shifted everything. In our case, it's OSS, Operation Stone Soup. And this is an important point that goes throughout the document. Unless otherwise specified, the we I'm referring to 
is the 1% of us who are the most dialed in, the most awake. The people on this call. Um, but even we need to get our heads screwed on straight, our hearts screwed on straight, and come together through co-creating and then using this new OSS, Operation Stone Soup, including its entire stack of pillars. Um, anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll go into all that. Um, let's see. Now let's go to the next section. And again, I can't encourage you guys enough to jump in and speak up at any moment, even if I'm talking. Um, naming and what it is, what is it that we're creating here? Well, the giant voids that I was talking about in, an early, in the context section, um, they can either be filled one by one or by one single thing, okay? But what are the dimensions of the void? What's missing is a new story for humanity, We've been running on this old story of hoarding, which is just so broken. Hey, Uncle Frank, good to see you. I'm screen sharing here. Let me just pop over and say a proper hello to Uncle Frank. Can you hear me, Uncle Frank? Hey, you're in your car. I think, I think you're connecting by phone, whereas before you were doing it by computer. Anyway, hopefully you can hear us, Uncle Frank, and welcome. All right, back to screen share. Okay. So we need a new story for humanity. We need a new way of feeding everyone. Guess what? The marketplace is not cutting it, especially when the marketplace is broken in half, right? Like it is now. People aren't working. If they're not working, they're not making money. If they're not making money, they can't go to the store and buy food. Now, if you're, if you're the wealthy, in the wealthiest 10 or 20%, you're fine. But what about the rest of us? So we need to figure that out. We need a new diet for a small planet. That's the title of a book from the, I think the 70s by Francis Moore LePay, an early pioneer in a lot of this thinking. Um, we need a new diet. We need a new mode of production for our global economy. Why, why, why do we do what we do economically, right? The old mode of production was hoarding, right? More for you, more for you, more for you. Um, until it almost killed us. And then it's like, uh, okay, I guess we maybe need to think about something different. We need either a new form or multiple new forms of governance, like sociocracy. We need a new form of planetary collective superintelligence, which is just beckoning. And uh, we either do it or we don't. And we need a way to cool our planet and to prevent future overheating. These are some of the things that we need, right, that are just beckoning to be filled with answers. Um, so in terms of naming, so that's the void that we want to fill. In terms of naming, a name that I'm kind of digging is Operation Stone Soup. Um, and one of the things I love about it is it brings in the realm of the fairy tale, the folk tale, right? And it just automatically connects you with that beautiful old story, Stone Soup, which we all love. Um, and it therefore stands on the shoulders of that greatness, right? There is deep wisdom in there, right? That's why it's such a powerful and successful story. Um, and, but then I also like adding the word operation because it gives it a feel of a serious operation, which is fast moving, very determined. It's just like, we're doing this. Anyway, so I'll just use it as a placeholder, Operation Stone Soup. Um, so what is Operation Stone Soup? And that's, this is worthy of a conversation in it, in it itself. What, what is this thing? What is this it that we're creating? I would start by offering that however else it ends up being characterized, that the characterization would include decentralized, right? Why? So that Operation Stone Soup can exist as a collection of autonomous local projects and initiatives, themselves of widely varying organizational and legal structures, depending on the location, the culture, laws, traditions, um, et cetera. Um, 
and this collection of local projects and initiatives would be held together and in fact integrated in myriad ways by collective superintelligence. So collective superintelligence is a big part, a major pillar of Operation Stone Soup and really helps hold it together. Um, and then with Operation Stone Soup, I want to acknowledge the enormity of what we're taking on beginning with the first three tangible goals to be accomplished simultaneously and holistically with the successful worldwide adoption of OSS, Operation Stone Soup. One is the eradication of hunger worldwide. The second is the eradication of pandemics. And the third is the eradication of carnivorism or simply non-plant-based foods. Now, look at those three objectives. Any one of those three would be worthy of a planetary movement to accomplish it. But the combination of all three as part of one single Operation Stone Soup is breathtaking. The second thing I'd like to acknowledge is the even greater enormity of an even larger, more powerful context. You see, these three create a context, right? We're gonna accomplish those three things. But then imagine we add two more to those. Humanity achieving its full evolutionary potential through collective superintelligence and cooling our planet in time through solar radiation management. In time for what? In time for saving life on Earth in time for preventing, we've already crossed the two degree centigrade mark. We are fast approaching the end, to quote Guy McPherson. Um, and so I'm simply saying, to, to sum it up, that these five bullets, the three on top and the two on the bottom here, the bullets that are highlighted, um, be the core pillars of Operation Stone Soup. End hunger, end pandemics, end carnivorism, which is a root cause of both, and go super intelligent and cool our planet. Feed everyone, heal ourselves, heal the world by stop killing it, get smart and get cool. Pretty, pretty simple, pretty tight, huh? Right? Here, let me go back and go to video for a second. And thank you, Emery, for the thumbs up. It's feed everyone, you know, be fed. No pandemics, be well. Stop killing, be compassionate, right? Get smart, get your head screwed on straight, humanity, all of us, right? And get cool. Cool it down, you got to cool it down, say, ooh, watch out, you're going to lose control. We got to cool it down. We're overheating, all right? All right, back to screen sharing. So pretty simple. Now, and by the way, a lot, a lot of these notes are just, I just kind of like, I just got to get this out there. So I was just like writing and throwing stuff into appropriate sections, so just bear with me. Operation Stone Soup as a can opener, like a spiritual can opener. And just like with a physical can opener, there is a singular point of contact. You know where that metal, that sharp metal wheel first hits the top of the can and punctures in? That's the moment of contact. That's the tipping point. And I liken that to when we get when we put the message out there about Operation Stone Soup and all that we're taking on. And in particular, we focus that message on the 1% of humanity who are truly awake, right? Look, you can imagine the scenario, and I sometimes use the metaphor of, of, of a dog whistle, right, that only a dog can hear. Here we are putting out our message, Operation Stone Soup, we're going to feed the world and pandemics, plant-based, 
da 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 and all that, you know, you can imagine most of humanity going like, what? Well, good luck. That's never going to happen. <laughs> right. But there will be a 1% approximately who are listening and say, wait a second. This looks like it might be the answer that we've been waiting for, that we've been looking for. My goodness. And they certainly have cojones, so you've got my attention, right? I'm not convinced yet whether you're going to succeed or fail, but you've got my attention, right? All right, back to sharing. And that singular moment, the wheel of the can opener punching through the steel, that singularity is none other than the press conference that we will do to announce Operation Stone Suit. It's five core pillars, it's mission, it's philosophy, it's everything. Here's the big idea, folks, right? And in particular, it's K-Mama-led mission to feed everyone and end pandemics. That, that, that's the opening salvo. We're here to feed everyone and end pandemics, right? Totally uncontroversial. Everyone can agree. Now, regarding the whole of it, and here is where I take the, the perspective of a cynic who's watching, the question will certainly come up that maybe we're taking on too much at once. I mean, really? Ending hunger, stopping pandemics, cooling the planet, going super intelligent. What's next, Einstein? Colonizing Mars? <laughs> Remember, I'm taking the perspective of, of a cynic, right? Saying, oh, well, that'll never happen. And we can actually answer these questions with a very simple answer. Look, as a species, we have tried separation, we've tried separating ourselves to the extreme where you literally have tens of millions of Americans living alone, one person per household. We are the most alone society ever concocted in the United States. Alone and separate, we each pursue our own agendas. And because we're such a social species, we see everyone else pursuing their own individual agendas, doing their own individual hoarding, et cetera, and we harmonize with that because we're social. And um, we become assimilated by a particular system with a particular MO, a particular driving force, and that's simply hoarding. Right? Well, we tried that and we've gotten the results that we've gotten a totally broken and dying world. So let's move on to the next section. Again, jump in any time. The five operational pillars of Operation Stone Soup, what it does. These are the physical things we set about doing. Eradication of hunger and malnutrition, eradication of pandemics, eradication of carnivorism, going super intelligent and SRM. These are the five physical things that we're setting out doing. Collective super intelligence, I just put a link to the 30 minute video page on Radish um, as a starting point. There's much more to say about that. In fact, I spent quite a bit of time writing up a bunch of stuff that I haven't included here because it's just too jumbled. Um, a new story for humanity. So imagine that all of this, everything we're writing about here, talking about with Operation Stone Soup, could be the beginning of a new story for humanity. So the story could go like this. Once upon a time, there was a species of humans and we overshot too many of us. We ended up with mass starvation and pandemics. And it turned out the solution to both was singular. Feed people nutritious plant-based foods delivered right to their homes. Um, 
And this is like a kind of an important distinction. Feed everyone versus end hunger. Do you see how like feed everyone is nothing but positive? Ending hunger kind of has like the shame and guilt associated with how the heck did we let hunger happen in the first place? But if we just focus on feeding everyone, there's no shame, there's no guilt, there's just the positive. Um, okay. Um, and then back to the story. And we realized that the key to making this gigantic solution a planetary scale reality was to tap into our collective intelligence, our collective power, our collective spirit, our collective everything. So we created collective superintelligence. Um, and then, you know, of course, there's other important elements to this story. The aerosol masking effect, global dimming, the global economy, ocean acidification and contamination, destruction of the biosphere, and the list goes on and on. And it's easy to get lost in the complexity of it all. Um, and let us consider that there are two words which are perhaps the best example of what I call the loose thread on the sweater, which if you pull on that thread, the whole thing unravels in a very good way in this case. And those two words are feed people or feed everyone, right? And here's an important, thing, because that's kind of our lead, our opening salvo, look, we're gonna feed everyone nutritious plant-based foods and that's how we're gonna stop the pandemic and solve a bunch of other problems. Well, that's gonna immediately lead to this question. Why now? In other words, haven't we been working on this since like 1984 and the Ethiopia Eritrea famine, right? And we have a very simple and powerful answer to that question, why now? Because we need to end pandemics in addition to ending hunger and malnutrition. And there, so what's the connection between feeding people and ending pandemics? We have two things that connect those two. One is social isolation, because if we deliver the food, then people don't have to go out and get food. Duh, right? So social isolation. And then more powerfully, with plant-based foods, we solve the root problem of pandemics, which is humans eating other animals. And this answers the question, why now? Whereas we couldn't, we weren't ready to do it before, now we have the perfect conditions for doing it. Um, and with that, we answer these questions of why and how with, well, we start with this fundamental motivating force of ending both hunger, mal hunger and malnutrition and uh, pandemics. And so at that point, I posit, we're left with no further questions, only the urgency of implementation. And I kind of go off a little bit here on the story and that even, even the most dyed in the wool Republican politician, anti-communist, pro-capitalist, et cetera, the typical stereotypical Republican, even that guy will end up saying, I, I believe, because of the urgency of stopping pandemics like COVID, this is simply something we must do now. We have been living with the challenge of how to end world hunger for centuries now, and finally we have the catalyst we need to make it happen and to solve a bunch of other problems in parallel. I'm saying this is a message everyone can get on board with. Um, anyway, um, I kind of go off a little bit more here. This is probably more detail than we need to go into now. Um, but I just emphasize that I really like feed people, feed everyone versus end hunger, as I talked about before. 
I go into that a little bit more. Um, and we, so we essentially sidestep this, you know, again, filled with guilt and shame, this concept of ending hunger. We can actually literally sidestep that by focusing on this extremely novel idea of delivering food to everyone as a public service for the common good. Anyway, again, I go into that a little bit more detail uh, than I think is helpful. But anyway, it's all there. Um, I definitely agree. I like the reframing of feeding everyone versus just ending hunger. Yeah, yeah. Ending hunger, it just, it kind of hits you in the stomach and you just kind of want to leave the room, you know? I mean, it's just like so big and it's just like, uh, it's kind of like that homework you've been putting off for two weeks and now it's due tomorrow and it's like, uh, can't it just like snow? and there be no school tomorrow can't we just get like a snow day right but anyway feed everyone it's just it's positive it's chop chop it's like well shoot why wouldn't we feed everyone let's do it right it's much more positive there's a lot less baggage anyway thanks thanks for that evan all right back to the document um let's see So the twin elements of focus, feed everyone um, and eradicate pandemics. Uh, let's see. Okay. Then the next one, the next section is changing the game, but first let me Go back to video. It looks like we got a couple of messages in the chat. Emery says, releasing the pressure, the pressure of doing what is required for the eradication of those things that are destroying life on earth. We open the can so we can. Very good. All right. Well, I'll keep moving ahead and I just keep encouraging you all to jump in with comments feedback, et cetera, changing the game. Um, and I kind of break this into two parts, part one and part two. In part one, I call it humanity's inner game, right? Getting fed, getting well, getting good, and getting smart. So getting fed, ending hunger, you know, feeding everyone. Getting well, ending pandemics. Getting good, ending carnivorism and getting smart, that's CSI. Now, do you see how these four are totally human-centric, right? Even though the first three depend intimately on our relationships with plants, with animals, and with all classes of microbes, germs, viruses, etc. Even though these first three uh, are intimately connected with other forms of life, they're fun fundamentally framed um, about humanity and about humanity's side of the relationship, right? Like stop killing animals. That's something for humanity to do. It's not like the animals are out there asking to be killed and therefore they're the problem. No, humanity is the problem. So that's why I call this part one of the game is about humanity getting its own inner game sorted out as a species. And then part two, I'm just kind of referring to it loosely as the whole game. Beyond the inner game, it's humanity now. Now that humanity has put on its own oxygen mask, <clears throat> it's about humanity stepping up to support Mother Earth and the diversity of, comp of complex life that we have today. And step number one in part two is SRM, pooling the planet. Everything else, um, in part one is all about humanity. In part two, we step outside of ourselves and um, 
and cool the planet. Actually, that's not totally true because in part one, we also have ending carnivorism, which definitely impacts the rest of animal life and the planet. So moving on, we are radically and simultaneously changing the game, the story, the paradigm, the context, the answers to the big questions. Who are we? Why are we here? How did we get here? And where are we going? We're now realizing our collective power to redesign and in fact radically transform any and all aspects of life on earth. We are realizing that we can all collectively agree to do something or not do something. And we see everyone around us complying with that agreement. So right now, what, what, what's this agreement? Staying home, wearing masks and gloves, etc. right? So we're seeing that we can agree to something and actually execute on it. And that can be radically different from what we did before. So now we are asking ourselves, where next shall we take Spaceship Earth? Where shall we go next? Now that we realize that we can do this together. And this new framing also begs some important questions. How about that maintenance on the ship that is long overdue? And hey, there's a whole bunch of crew members who aren't even eating. And that's both the single biggest problem they are facing as well as the tip of the iceberg of myriad problems from the deep root causes all the way to the most visible, most acute, like hunger and exponential planetary overheating. Okay, so where does Operation Stone Soup play in all of this? Think of Operation Stone Soup as the bottle opener. I said can opener before, but now I'm saying bottle opener. Once the bottle is open, there is still a heck of a lot of work to do emptying the contents of the bottle and all the glasses that need to be filled, but opening the bottle is the key inflection point. So OSS is the bottle opener because it opens our minds and our hearts to a whole new world, radically different from the brutal, barbaric world we presently inhabit. And it is a brutal, barbaric world. Oh, let me correct that. It is a brutal, barbaric world unless you are privileged enough to live in a castle or a fortress or a McMansion of some sort. And then it is only brutal and barbaric on the outside of your McMansion, right? And you don't have anything to do with that. Or do you? Where did all that lumber come from? Where did all that food come from? Where did all that meat come from? How about all that oil, steel, and cement, right? So even the people who are barricaded in and say, no, 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 I just live in this peaceful, tranquil mansion full of all this wealth, um, a lot of blood had to get shed outside your mansion in order to build your mansion and supply it. And then the next section is the press conference. And I'm calling this the singularity. I'm calling the press conference that we do, this new press conference, the key inflection point for the history of life on Earth. Just like the press conference that President Vicente Fox and I organized in 2013 was the key inflection point in transforming drug policy worldwide. It was only a few months later that the Uruguayans, who were guests at our conference, took it all the way through the goalposts and was the, became the first country to legalize cannabis. They did that because we had the the stuff, the huevos, to actually make that key inflection point, actually strike the hot piece of steel with the hammer at the right moment and say, boom, this changes everything from this moment forward. Drug policy would never be the same, worldwide drug policy, after that press conference. So what are the goals of the press conference? Um, 
I believe the goal, the singular goal, should be nothing less than making our mega solution of Operation Stone Soup the number one most talked about story in the world. And if we don't get number one, but instead we're number two or number three, well, that's okay too, right? So <laughs> shoot for the stars and you'll hit the moon kind of thing. The success or failure of Operation Stone Soup, I posit, will ride on two things. The first is timing. This is an important point. I predict that someone or some organization is going to get the world's attention with a Feed Everyone campaign, which is credible. Someone's going to get there first. Will it be us or will it be someone else? Well, if we want to make Operation Stone Soup successful, it had better well be us. Law number one of the 22 immutable laws of marketing is it's better to be first than it is to be better. So whoever is first at getting the world's attention with a Feed Everyone campaign, that is going to be decisive. So timing is crucial. If we want to succeed, we got to get the timing right. We've got to do this before some other group does, right? And the second element of our success or failure, and let me just say hello to Maida. Welcome, Maida. Good to see you. Hello, thank you. Nice to see you all. Awesome. All right, we're just, I'm just screen sharing and going through this long document that I sent out last night at the tail end of the email in agenda. And I assume you're getting those emails, Maida. So the second key element to our success is our message and our call to action to the world, both locally, regionally, nationally, and globally. What is our message? We have to get that one right. And where does our message stand relative to other, I'll just say competitors, in the big solutions category, right? Um, I once had a therapist who I believe correctly identified me. He said, Jamin, you're, you're a big game hunter, <laughs> right, as a metaphor, right? You're, you're going after big things. You're not just content having a job and making a living. You're, you're going after big things. And I plead guilty to that charge. Um, so there's a category that we're playing in, which is the category of big solutions. Okay. We need to be very clear on where we stand relative to other competing big solutions. But this gets back to point number one and timing, which is regardless of what other big solutions are out there, the first one that blasts its way through and blasts its way into your mind, you, the consumer of media, the consumer of stories, the first message that blasts in is the one that's gonna take root. That's just the way marketing works, right? Um, and I think we've got a fabulous one with the five pillars of OSS, which go way beyond ending hunger, way beyond ending pandemics, um, there are all the five pillars that we talked about. Feed everyone, end pandemics, end carnivorism, get smart and cool the planet. One, two, three, four, five. Bam, 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 right? And of course, those five are just the beginning. Once, and, and those five also constitute a platform, a foundation. Um, I need to take a bathroom break. So shall I pause recording? Why don't I pause recording? Then we can just hang out and I'll be back probably in like five minutes ish. So pausing recording now. One. Okay, welcome back. All right, screen sharing the document. So we're talking about, you know, we, we were last talking about the two elements critical to our success. Um, excuse me, excuse me. Um, so one is timing about being first in, in making this big announcement that we're going to feed everyone. And the second is our message and our call to, to, to action. How powerful is that message? 
how credible, right? Where does it land relative to other messages that are out there? And that's one of the exciting things about this moment. There is no solution on the table presently that anyone's talking about at any kind of scale. There just isn't. So when we do our press conference and say, hello world, we've got a solution, that solution will be alone. There will be no competitors that I can, that I know of. If you know of a competitor, let me know. A real, com a real credible competitor to Operation Stone Soup that says, yeah, we've got a way to solve our problems. Here it is, right? Okay, back to screen share. Okay, um, then I've got a section on SRM, um, which we've talked about plenty and I haven't really, I just put the basics there that it's absolutely urgent. We can't mess around. Um, another section on the whole of it, um, holism, um, that the, it's the topic of the multi, multiple urgencies of our time. Not just a pandemic, not just exponential abrupt climate change, not just a collapsing economy, not just collapsing food networks, not just exponentially growing hunger, but all those together and dozens more. From the economic, to the political, to the social, to the food, to our footprint on the planet, to the cultural, to the spiritual, no matter how you slice it, humanity has made quite a cluster mess, which is extremely apparent and very much in our faces right now, like it never has been before. So people's minds are open like they've never been before. And either we continue to try to solve our problems individually, which in practical terms boils down to leveraging market-based forces with the present game of hoarding, hoarding money, hoarding land, hoarding animals, hoarding human beings, hurting them, hoarding is hurting. Or we make a profound shift and choose to look at the whole of Spaceship Earth, Mother Earth, holistically, and even look at ourselves as a whole, a whole species. Imagine a single colony of human beings occupying a single Spaceship Earth. I mean, that's our reality. We just don't choose to look at it that way. And we can come up with a holistic plan of action which we can then socialize with the world and in the process co-evolve the plan with humanity's evolution as a species. As we become, as we get closer and closer together, we become more and more humane. We've all experienced that on, on our video conferences, right? You're feeling depressed, you're alone, you're this, you're that, whatever, you're bored. Then you just say, screw it. And you jump on one of our video conferences and it's like, yeah, this is it, right? You're no longer so alone. You're connected, you're in a conversation, you're creating, you're sharing. You're bouncing back and forth off of other people. You know what I'm saying? Y'all with me? Yeah. All right. So the approach we are taking is the one we believe and we welcome any challenges to it. We believe this approach is the one which will maximize the preservation, protection, ongoing protection, and in fact, healing of ecosystems of species, including but not limited to our own species, humanity. And looking at the whole of our problems and the whole of our opportunities, we have devised what looks to us like an optimal pathway, right? The five pillars of Operation Stone Soup. Feed everyone, end pandemics, end carnivorism, get smart and cool the planet. Now, there may be many optimal pathways and some will certainly be better than others. 
anyway, our pathway is one of those better ones, and we're happy to hear about other possible optimal pathways. To get us from our current predicament to a place of safety, of protection, of healing, and long-term, really long-term sustainability and viability as a species, and, and as part of the web of life on Earth. And it is vital, we are a vital part, in the sense that humanity is needed to, at a minimum, undo the mega screw-ups that we have achieved over the course of the past several decades and centuries. So we are needed. We can't just exit at this point and say, okay, Humanity sucks, therefore we're going. No, we need to stick around and clean up <laughs> at a minimum. All right. Second to the last section. And the last one, by the way, is a long one that really kind of sums it up. So I'm kind of saving the best for last. This section is called the iPhone of global transformation. What optimal pathway have you devised or heard of which may be better than or perhaps pursued in parallel with the five pillar optimal pathway that we're proposing with Operation Stone Soup? I'll keep repeating the five pillars. Feed everyone, end pandemics, end carnivorism, get smart and cool the planet. And th that's just the starting point. That creates a, those five create a foundation for life, right? Uh, and then there's a heck of a lot more to do beyond that, of course. But we're saying, hey, this is what we got. What do you got? What we're basically saying here is, look, we have lots and lots and lots of problems, lots of opportunities. But we're, what we're basically creating here to try to be a bit poetic is the iPhone of global transformation. That basic fundamental set of features and scenarios we can all agree to. And all of which needs to interoperate. It, you know, um, I, I don't know if this is the best metaphor, but um, basically what the iPhone did was said, look, all right, there's all these scenarios that need to be, you know, included in a killer app, handheld mobile phone, <laughs> mobile smartphone, right? This, 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 this. And then iPhone set out to achieve them all and just conquered the market right? We need a similar bundle, right? Remember before the iPhone, it's like, well, there's a Microsoft phone, there's an Android, whatever, but, but none of them had just had nailed it, right? iPhone set out to nail it. We are setting out to nail it. Create that bundle that is, um, and and I'm saying here it's black and white. Either you buy into our iPhone product or you're buying into some competing Android or Microsoft or whatever competing product, right? And there are you know, a bunch of competing products out there in the marketplace of, hey, what should we be doing to solve our problems, right? Everyone's talking about it. Everyone's got an opinion about it, right? It's kind of like the cell phone market before iPhones. There was a bunch of crap out there and none of it was nailing it. And then iPhone said, enough, let's nail it. So we're basically seeking to be the iPhone of global transformation. And if OSS is the iPhone of global transformation, then K-Mama will be its killer app. But instead of that terminology, let's instead to use using life-giving app rather than killer app, <laughs> which is what it's all about. Um, and it's not like a smartphone is optional, right? And again, I'm talking to the 1% of us who are the most dialed in. And 1% of humanity is close to 80 million people, so it's not a small number. We are the ones with the right stuff. Um, and it may be a lot more than 1%. I'm just ballparking it. Um, and, um, and I make the point here that when I say that 
we understand, we 1% understand that we urgently need a new path forward. Um, and new is perhaps redundant as there does not yet exist a default path forward. We're just bumbling along as humanity right now. Killing here, killing there, overheating there, acidifying there, no plan, no plan. Just market forces unleashed. Therefore, OSS has the opportunity to literally be the iPhone of global transformation, which everyone hears about, but only a small percentage get initially, right? Um, this is a, an important point, right? So when the iPhone came out, everyone heard about it. Not everyone rushed out and bought one. They were kind of expensive, right? But everyone heard about it. It was the talk of the town. In the realm of global transformation and solving our problems, I posit that even once we do our press conference and we announce OSS, everyone will hear about it. Not everyone will get it, right? And people can argue about it. Oh, that's ridiculous, such an expensive phone. Who the, you know, oh, da, da, da. oh you know, we don't need to feed everyone. Da, da, that sounds like communism, right? You, you can almost hear the reactions that some folks are gonna have. Well, uh, <laughs> Emory writes, Obama phones were free. <laughs> I, don't, I don't even remember those. <laughs> um, anyway, feel free to enlighten us. Um, all right. Um, and, but the 1% or whatever number who actually get it. Well, there's 1% of us who are sufficiently dialed in that we have the potential to get it. Um, and imagine we just start with that 1%, kind of as a starter community. I would posit that that 1% is exactly the community we want. It is a community of deeply committed compassionate, awake, and to varying degrees transformed, uh, generally, what would generally be regarded as intelligent, but that's actually a far less important factor than the others, like compassion, for example. Now, by announcing ourselves, coming out publicly, and announcing this iPhone of global transformation, during the very early stages of its development, we are accomplishing a trick that Steve Jobs and others have played in the technology sector, which is called vaporware, right? Let's talk about vaporware for a second. Raise your hands if you think you know what I'm saying when I say vaporware. Okay, so what do I mean by vaporware? So, when Steve Jobs announced publicly that they were going to be launching the iPhone, that happened about one year before they actually launched the iPhone, right? So they essentially, welcome Stephanie, great to see you Stephanie. They essentially launched the idea and the promise of the iPhone a year before launching the actual iPhone. What effect did that have? People who were planning on getting a new smartphone said, hmm, do I buy one now or do I wait a year and then get an iPhone, right? So they essentially started gobbling up market share even before they launched the product. That's vaporware. It's called vaporware because you're not launching an actual physical product that you can hold. You're launching the vapor, the idea, the dream, right? And we're largely, what I'm proposing is that we play that same trick. I've done it before. Um, we launch the idea before launching the actual thing. And that way we gain mind share because it's not about first to market, it's about first to mind. That first law of marketing, that it's better to be first than it is to be better, it's about being first in the mind. 
And that's what iPhone accomplished. They became first to mind even before they existed as a physical thing. Um, and then I go into some other stuff that's a little bit esoteric, not really essential. Um, okay. Finally, the last section, which is the longest, in summary and conclusion, what is the bottom line? For me, there are two bottom lines. First, we need to discuss all these topics and many more within the very framework of collective intelligence, which is moving in the direction of CSI, collective superintelligence as a goal. Um, so I'm basically saying we need to apply our collective intelligence as it is right now to all these topics with a view to coming up with a final plan. Um, and second, we have a golden opportunity which we can jump all over and boil down some of the definition of the thing, starting out with, um, well, here, I'll just put it this way. We can say, look, what if we wanted to set about creating a minimum viable product, an MVP? We've got Operation Stone Soup, we've got K-Mama, we've got collective superintelligence, we've got the iPhone of global transformation as a concept. Um, each of these is a partial framing. What we need is to kind of put all this together and come up with a kind of a complete tight framing. Um, and that's what I'm attempting to do here, but I'm just saying if we get together and wrap, put our heads together, we can do a, do a better job of it. So this thing, this Frankenstein mashup of all the above, somehow rolled up into a convenient iPhone envelope or a container. So you can basically hold the thing in your hands and say, okay, I got it. Now I get what this OSS thing is and have a feeling for what you're holding. We basically need to completely define the thing. So if it were up to Jamin, which thankfully it is not, Jamin would draft up something like the following for starters. And I quote, and I quote, I'm quoting myself. What we are launching here is called Operation Stone Soup, OSS, which is a decentralized planetary movement of humanity operating as individuals, as residents of Mother Earth, as opposed to representing some government or institution. I'm basically saying everyone represents themselves. We're coming totally free and unencumbered and saying, okay, we're just showing up as humanity. Um, and we focus together on the whole answer to the question, how should we orchestrate to the best of our abilities the evolution of life on Earth, including but not limited to the evolution of humanity, civilizations, and all gigantic transformational things, such as, for example, the bulleted list of the five pillars of OSS. Feed everyone, end pandemics, end carnivorism, get smart and cool the planet. Basically, how do we orchestrate things so that we optimize for the trajectory that humanity and in fact all of life on Earth takes as we progress forward into the future? Um, I'm talking at a kind of a high level, but it'll, it'll get clear. So, um, so I say then hypothetically, let's suppose we go through that entire process. Where might we net out? It's impossible to predict, but if Jamin had to predict right now on the spot, here is what he would predict. And I'm happy to be wrong about this, but I would predict that where we're gonna net out after this process is that we agree to do a press conference and we make precise announcements along the following lines. So here's where it all comes together. Now we're at the press conference, okay? And I'm saying this is what I think if I had to guess right now what we could say that would be the most powerful, here it is. Hello world! In a nutshell, here is what we have reached a consensus on. And the first thing to point out is that this is our best approximation 
of a reasonably complete consensus as of today. This is just disclaimer, right? All I'm saying is, um, you know, the consensus will evolve possibly quite quickly as we seem to be approaching some sort of singularity encompassing the economy, politics, culture, disease, pandemics, food, climate change, media, and I'm sure at least a dozen other key dimensions. Don't you all feel it? Don't you feel that we're just cruising towards this just singularity where something is going to get figured out? Either we're all going to get wiped out and go down in a blaze of glory of nuclear mushroom clouds and starvation and disease, or we're gonna figure out how to come together. But something is gonna happen, right? Jamin, Jamin. Yes, what, right. Is, what is singularity? I mean, define for me. Yeah, okay. So, so singularity, and I first learned about singularity from Ray Kurzweil in 2005, who published the book, The Singularity is Near. There, he was talking about a technological singularity where everything is, is growing exponentially all at the same time. And it's like, whoa, we're, we're fast approaching a technological singularity where we're basically going to have strong artificial intelligence, ubiquitous computing, connectivity, this, that, 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 right? And he was predicting humanity basically going through a radical phase transition, which we're arguably going through right now right? Um, so that's what I mean by singular. It's a singular moment where it's just like, like when a car crashes into a wall at 80 miles an hour, that's a singularity. The moments preceding the crash were build up to the singularity, but we're, we're just, something has got to give is the bottom line, right? Or a lot of somethings at once, and that's probably the most likely. All right. So um, we are participating in and may in fact have something to do with the creation of an illusion that we are indeed leading a decentralized planetary movement to ensure that we accomplish the following objectives simultaneously and holistically. And here's where we lay out our objectives that we feed everyone nutritious, immune-boosting, plant-based foods delivered right to their door. We end pandemics, and we talk about how this gets to the root, humans eating other animals, um, compromised immune systems, and solving once and for all the chronic world problems of hunger, starvation, malnutrition, and the myriad ongoing health and life impacts of the preceding, including compromised immunology. Next big pillar is going super intelligent as a species. Um, and this is, the wording is a little bit jumbled here, but it's basically just talking about CSI um, and everyone kind of choosing their own modalities within it, whether to participate in video conferences or discussion forums or whatever. Um, and then finally cooling mother earth. and the imperative to implement planetary scale SRM as quickly as possible. And I've put these as four different clusters. Remember before I talked about five pillars, well, I've put the pillar of ending carnivorism and ending pandemics, I've rolled those two together. Um, into simply ending pandemics. So four clusters, five pillars, it all covers the same thing. Feed everyone, end pandemics, end carnivorism, go super intelligent and cool the planet. And that's, that, that, that's, that's the heart of what we're presenting. Um, 
And listen to this. We come out big and bold and say, look, the only way in which we can conceive of truly solving our biggest problems, which threaten our survival, is to solve the entire set of, the, of these four clusters holistically and simultaneously. It's like if we don't do all of them, we're not going to do any of them. What do I mean by that? If we don't go super intelligent, how do we plan on feeding everyone? It's going to take tremendous intelligence to feed everyone, to work out all the logistics, all the mechanisms, right? So we need to go super intelligent to feed everyone. But we also need to feed everyone in order to go super intelligent because if we don't feed everyone, we're going to have Mad Max. We're going to have just a crazy, violent world in which it'll be very, very difficult to do anything. Likewise with the pandemics. We need to end pandemics. Otherwise, we can't operate. And we definitely need to cool the planet or we won't be able to do jack starting in about eight months or so. So we've got to do it all together. In other words, here's another way of saying it. Take any one of the preceding four clusters. Feed everyone, end pandemics, go super intelligent, and cool Mother Earth. Those are the four clusters. And remember, I've rolled up end, ending carnivorism with ending pandemics. So that's where it, that lives. We maintain that the most efficient, most effective way to truly address that one single cluster, pick your cluster. We're basically saying the only, the most efficient, effective way to address that one cluster is to simultaneously and holistically address all of the clusters. Simultaneously and holistically on all levels. In simpler terms, we maintain that it is borderline self-evident at this point, that it is far more effective to simultaneously and holistically address all the clusters than trying to, going at, than trying to go at them one by one. If we try to end hunger without going super intelligent, I think we're going to fall on our faces. We need massive intelligence for this. Um, anyway, and this principle, I'll just... I refer to with the word holism, which means the whole, the holistic. Um, and of course, within each cluster, there are myriad subclusters, topics, subtopics, projects, initiatives, solutions, communities. All of those need to be integrated into the whole. So Operation Stone Soup is about bringing us all together and all these topics together into one big hole. Um, Einstein's famous quote that we cannot solve our problems with the same level of thinking that created them. OSS represents a whole new level of thinking. Holistic, simultaneous, and leveraging collective superintelligence. And we have a solution for both generating this new level of thinking and to take it literally into the realm of collective superintelligence. And that's encapsulated in CSI, our whole strategy for CSI, which is one of the four clusters. And all of the proceeding could be boiled down into something which we could characterize as the beginning of a new story for humanity from this moment forward. And that story could begin. Once upon a time, there was a species called humans. Having definitively woken up to the fact that we had overshot in 2020, we immediately set out about feeding everyone, ending pandemics, going super intelligent, and finally cooling it, cooling the planet, cooling it down to the optimal pre-industrial levels of the Renaissance. And once we had accomplished those four things, we found it infinitely easier to wrap our collective minds and hearts around all of the other problems and opportunities left for us to address collectively. And these were many. 
Many were well known, others were less well known, and all were treated with respect within a holistic context. Looking within this broadest possible holistic context, spanning all problems and opportunities related to Mother Earth and all her children, including ourselves, we might look at the above four clusters as four foundational pillars upon which we could build on to address the rest of our problems and opportunities. So basically, once we get those four clusters mastered, they represent a foundation, right? Let's just review that real quickly here. Um, so the clusters, feed everyone. Wait a second. All right, looks like we got Mark joining us. Let me say hello to Mark real quick. Can I ask a question? Yes, and please, please, Fred, yes. Mm -hmm. Is this, okay, this is the, um, what are we calling this? This is the press conference? Where the, the, what's going to be covered in the press conference? That's a part of it, but there's something even bigger than the press conference, which is the entire project, which is which we're calling preliminarily Operation Stone Soup. Okay. And who, how is the press conference being handled? Who are we approaching for that? And why are they going to let us do it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'll tell you what. Let, let, let's, let's get to that in a minute. Let, I'm almost okay. done with the overall presentation. Welcome, Mark. Feel free to say hello whenever you feel like it. We are recording. Let me get back to this document that I'm screen sharing. Hello. Hey, Mark. Welcome. How are you doing? Uh, doing okay. Am I better off muting it once I, if I'm not talking? Oh, definitely, definitely. Uh, we ask everyone to mute when they're not talking and then just unmute when you got anything to say. Just jump in anytime. All right. Welcome. All right. I'm just screen sharing, almost done reviewing this long document, and then we can get into Fred's questions. But Operation Stone Soup has four pillars. Feed everyone end pandemics and including ending carnivorism, which is the root cause of pan human pandemics, going super intelligent as a species and cooling our planet. Those are the four uh, pillars. And um, I'm, I'm referring to these as four foundational pillars. Feed everyone, end pandemics, go super intelligent, and cool the planet. Because once we have those four pillars in place, we, we now have a foundation for an amazing life on Earth, where we don't overheat, we don't die of starvation, we don't die of disease, and we actually have a platform for communicating, collaborating, and co-creating whatever we need to create to survive and thrive. And in the story that I'm telling here, the moment when humanity wrapped its collective mind and heart around the fact that um, these four pillars, these pillars, these clusters that were essential to be mastered, um, that moment when we collectively figured that out, and again, the we refers to the 1% of us who are the most dialed in, the most awake, because it's the 1% of us who are really in the game, who have the opportunity to orchestrate the transformation for all of life. In other words, we don't have to have the other 99% on board. If they're asleep, they're asleep and we'll be the ones who do the, the transforming or orchestrating the transforming. Um, and Buckminster Fuller style, we will give the rest of humanity these tools that will change them, right? So the first folks we need to be mostly focused on transforming are the 1%, basically ourselves. How do we transform ourselves to the point 
that we get ourselves together to lead the rest of the world. Jamie, and, one, one quick comment. Yes. Are the 99% passive or, or active in their, well, own, in their own world? I mean, are they passively sitting by and watching the 1% affect changes or are they going to be militant are they going to resist okay end of question yeah yeah um so here's how i see it one percent of humanity is close to 80 million people if these one percent are participating in collective super intelligence in a vast network of meetings like this one can you imagine the 1% of humanity, the 80 million people who are the most dialed in, the most awake, the most compassionate, the most committed, all participating in meetings like this in a very well-architected, um, well-organized network of conversations with transcription and search and all these tools so that you can find that conversation where you want to plug into. Those 80 million people will become unstoppable in terms of co-creating the transformations, the physical transformations that are needed, whether it's physical transformations in our food networks, physical transformations in terms of cooling the planet through SRM, etc., We'll be unstoppable. Why? Because we will be vastly more intelligent than any other organization of humanity, be it Facebook, be it Twitter, be it the Department of Defense, be it the White House, their collective intelligences will pale in comparison to ours for multiple reasons. One is just sheer numbers, 80 million people together, right? Operating within, co-creating, maintaining, and optimizing a platform and culture of collective superintelligence, like we're pioneering right here, right now right? The 80 million people will cultivate their own garden of collective superintelligence. You know, the two or three million coders within those 80 million will just be jamming open source on GitHub, creating the next iteration, the next iteration, the next iteration of myriad different components in the platform for CSI. So imagine the 80 million of us together, united, figuring all this stuff out, planning out the next press conference, planning out the next media blasts, right? Planning out the next speeches, all the stuff that will orchestrate and mesmerize, for lack of a better word, the 99% who are just watching Fox News and going, duh, I'd like to have an F-250 pickup truck for me, <sighs> right? Look, they're going to do what they're going to do. But we have the opportunity to orchestrate what they do. That's the bottom line. Right? You want to get a bunch of rowdy kids on the playground to stop fighting? You give them the right incentives. You create the, the right structure, the right game. And then 12 months later, they're all good, happy, smiling, studious children. They're no longer fighting and sniffing glue and stealing uh, hubcaps, all right? We orchestrate our sheep. We become the shepherds. Look, somebody's got to do it. Or do we abdicate that responsibility and just let death happen? I was about to say let life happen, but it's not happening. Death is happening. Why? Because we have collectively abdicated our responsibility. As the grown-ups in the room, right? We could either clean up the summer camp and stop kids from getting beaten up and, and screwed up and malnourished and drugged out. We can either clean up the summer camp or just let it do its thing. So far, we've been letting it do its thing. How well is that working out? Mass extinction, melting of ice, just death everywhere, carnivorism. The answer is obvious. It's not working out. So what I'm proposing is the metaphorical grown-ups in the room who are all of us, right? It has nothing to do with age. 
a 15 year old could pop on and be one of the grownups in the room, right? So either we get together and clean up this summer camp or it's gonna all go down in flames and nuclear radiation and starvation and viruses and all these terrible things. So camp counselors, are we ready to put, to put this summer camp in order or not? Well, lots of people have had the idea that you could unite humanity under a, any particular religious umbrella you can think of or an, any ethnic umbrella. Basically all of the sort of big umbrella groups have failed one way or the other. Uh, and partly that has to do with the fact that they are centralized. They have been centralized around something that is not universal to begin with, uh, and they imagined could eventually be universal. So somehow we have to be radically uh, inclusive and agnostic in our philosophy at the same time that we are trying to appeal to everyone. Um, and I don't know that anyone has ever solved that problem. Uh, and I think one way is to start with the notion that you ha are, don't have uh, a fixed agenda, that you're going to let it self-organize uh, until it creates something irresistible to the masses. Yeah, beautiful, Mark. And you've actually summarized much of what we just covered in the review of the document over the last, uh, you know, hour and a half. Um, and so what I went through was a narrative where we basically said, look, we are engaging in a process to come out, to come up with the right overall program, right? And that process is not complete. But if I had to predict what we're gonna say on the press conference, this is what I think we'd say, right? And I address these four major pillars of feeding everyone, nutritious, immune-boosting, plant-based plant -based foods delivered directly to their homes. Um, in the process, ending pandemics, going super intelligent through a collective super intelligent process like we're engaged in here, and finally cooling the planet through solar radiation management. I'm saying those are the four starting pillars for creating a foundation for life. But even those four, hey, maybe there'll be seven instead of four, maybe there'll be three instead of four, maybe there'll be different pillars. That, to your point, Mark, that that's where instead of having a fixed agenda, right, I'm saying, um, let's not have a fixed agenda. Let's leverage our collective super intelligence to figure out what the optimal program is for the planet. Um, and uh, now that pre what I just said presupposes that there could be an optimal program and that it could be implementable. Happy to debate both of those. Um, but the reality is the planet is moving forward on a given trajectory right now that was determined by decisions made over the last 10,000 years, starting with the agricultural revolution, right? So if a well-defined trajectory was created um, with minimal intentionality and basically humanity kind of going with the flow, what I'm really suggesting here, one of the foundational principles that I'm suggesting is that we can actually apply intentionality to the evolution of life on Earth and where we go with Spaceship Earth next. I could be wrong. In fact, uh, you know, a, a pretty smart friend of mine a couple, a few years ago, as I was telling him my ideas about all this, he said, Jamin, you're never gonna be able to influence the macro, what he calls the macro, right? What happens at large in the world. That's just going to do its thing. I totally disagree. And in fact, I've completely reconfigured my life in service of my belief that we can influence the macro, that we can influence the trajectory. Yes, yes, Melvin. Go, go ahead. Hey, Jamin, you know, um, I was in and out, but I've got the gist of what you were saying. The four pillars is awesome. As you know, 
um, Shelly Ostoff, the coach for a healthy earth. I think she really also offers an organizational framework and structure for that. And uh, how do you influence the masses? As um, uh, Buck Minister was saying, I can't, uh, Buck Minister said, I can't, uh, um, uh, uh, um, um, quote exactly what he said, but you have to give people a tool if you want to change them, not try to give them ideas or, or, or theories and stuff. And there's two Salesh has been talking about, it. you know, it's part of, it is, is a new currency, you know, moving from a uh, 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 money profit driven economy to a service driven economy. So, you know, and, and then Salesh also talk about the, the greatest transformation in human history, uh, you know, in the seven core shifts that we have to make. And what they are, are saying really makes a lot to make a lot of sense to me. And it really uh, um, uh, dovetail right into what you, you've just put out. Uh, we, we, I think it's important that we have a coherent narrative or organizational structure of how we want to do things. And codes really do that well for me, uh, if you're familiar with the codes. And one of them, the, the first one is, of the codes, it said aspire to do no harm and organize our thoughts, our words, and our action with that which is nourishing for the entire community of life. You know, those codes like that, you can't go wrong with, with codes like that. And it's, you know, if, if the action that a project or a research endeavor or, or anything you want to do, if it's not nourishing the entire community of life, you just scrap it. You just don't do it, you know. And then when she talked about law and economy, you know, where uh, the best and all enterprises that, 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 that harm or could harm, you know, earth to life, you know, those codes are, are really, it's really easy for me to put my mind around those codes and the seven shifts that Silesh uh, 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 laid out for us. And, and I think those, the, the greatest transformation in the, the seven shifts and, and what Shelley is, is put out so beautifully, it, it really goes along well with what, what you're speaking to. So, you know, because, you know, we often talk about what we want, we want to make change, 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 and that's great. But what type of organiz, or organizational structure we want to put this change in? And Shelly already put it out there for us. She already, for me, it's already out there, you know, it, the, the, the code for a healthy earth. And, you know, when she talking about everybody should have uh, guaranteed access to, uh, you know, clean water, fresh air, healthy soil, uh, comfortable shelter, you know, and things like that, you know, it, it's really out there for us. And we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, and would, if we, you know, embrace that more and tell that story more about the codes for the healthy earth and what Silesh, uh, uh, has, has put out there for us. To me, those, those stories uh, uh, get to the root of the problem. Also what Dr. Will Tuttle has put out, they really get to the root of the problem. And that's what we have to do, get to the root, like with this pandemic that we're experiencing right now. Uh, and when you look at, listen to the CDC and all the uh, authorities uh, on what we should do to try to uh, uh, protect ourselves from this here pan pandemic and stop the spread of it. None of them are talking about the root, the root cause of the problem. They, 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 they won't even touch it. But I've been hearing that, you know, someone else said earlier, I think, I don't know if it was here or someone else said nature, mother nature is, is, is forcing it on us. You know, the uh, 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 pig manufacturers, uh, these here animal, farmers. <laughs> I mean, all these people getting sick, the, the workers in these here factory farms are getting sick and forcing these here uh, 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 
pig factory farms and all these factory farms to shut down, shut down. Uh, this is it's a unique opportunity for us because we, we are people here know that the root cause is animal. What are we doing to the animal, the animal agriculture? We, we understand that, that is, we are part of a planetary ecosystem, ecosystem, and that um, our well being is interdependent upon the well being of the environment and um, all species in this environment. And Shelly, for me, she really hits the nail on the head uh, with the codes for the healthy earth and Silesh. Uh, when he talk about the seven, four shifts we have to make, he get down to that seventh one and he said, if we don't do this one, nothing else can work. And any efforts that we put down to try to transition and change the world to a better place. If we don't deal with that money part, uh, uh, everything else is going to seem like we chasing our tails. It's going to seem futile. So I think it's, it, it, it's, it's um, very important that we always have this narrative about we have to change the money system. We have to change the money system. We have to change the money system. We have to go to a service economy. Because without a service economy, uh, you're just going to have the bill, the 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 one percent still running everything. I don't care how you do it, how pretty you put it, how you wrap it up at the Green Deal, you're still going to have the one percent. You're still going to have the. It's going to still be a centralized authority. There won't be any distributive leadership. You know, it'll still be centralized leadership. It'll just be more of the same, all dressed up, really flashy, really pretty. And, you know, so uh, I'm kind of rambling now. I just want to bring it back again to what Shelley have said in the, the um, codes for a healthy earth and eco-governance, the only legitimate purpose of governance is to protect and cultivate the health and vitality of Earth and all the inhabitants on Earth for the generations to come. I mean that. I don't know how you can top that. <laughs> you know, if we if we all, you know, can embrace that and put that narrative, that story out there, just push it, push it, push it, push it. And I think we need we need a coherent voice. We need a coherent narrative, a story to tell. And for me, Silesh and uh, 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 Dr. Will Tuttle and um, uh, Shelly has given me that coherent story to tell because it's so inclusive, it's so inclusive. It cuts across uh, national, cultural, racial, social, economic lines to, in, in, to include everybody, everybody when you talk about uh, doing everything that, that's this this uh, this healing for the whole earth. Every every action that we talk, every action, every plan, every design we have, every idea we want to implement. How is this nourishing for the entire community of life? Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you, Melvin. Yeah, I love uh, Shelley's Codes for a Healthy Earth, Shelley and Jan, and uh, have had uh, wonderful meetings with them over the course of the past year since I was introduced to them by, uh, by Silish. <coughs> and, um, you know, one of the key questions that um, I think we need to face is, you know, what do we what do we actually do, right? What do we actually do? So, you know, is it enough to simply endorse the codes for the healthy, codes for a healthy earth? You know, post a link on our Facebook page, give it a like, say, yep, this is it, this is it, this is it. And, um, you know, and then, you know, is that enough? I mean, does it, is it just going to take a critical mass of humanity reading the codes for a healthy earth and then somehow we wake up one morning and it's just like we're in a whole new world because a critical mass of humanity assimilated it? Or are there 
in addition to supporting the codes for a healthy earth, are there specific actions, physical actions that we can take other than just going to bed at night and praying for the codes for a healthy earth and then waking up in the morning and saying, are we there yet? Right. Um, you know, I'm being, I'm being colorful in my, in my speech, but, but it's, you know, it's, it's to make a point that just liking and endorsing a document uh, does not transform the world. There are actions. Yeah. I, I really, I have to take the issue with you because if I want to invent, invent, anything if i'm not divided the guided by the code i'm going to just take something invented and fuck up the world i don't care what it is a can opener or whatever what it is we have to have a, a, a near right now each one of us each one of us i don't care how advanced how brilliant how well different we think we are we are still we are still within the the, the framework of this western indoctrination brainwashing bullshit that we have and we can't even get out of it i don't care we can't we can't so you know this is one of the reasons why i think i don't know somebody the catholic said you give me a baby and uh something you give me a child and and, and and let me have him for three years and he'll be a catholic forever it's the jesuits yeah the jesuits you give each seven i'll have you for life i'll have you, I'll for, have life. you for life see that's why we have to have we have to take action from a model. Now, you take a guy like, uh, uh, we, we, everybody look at, what's this guy, not us here, but people look at Jeff Bezos. Well, look at where this guy model came from. Look, look what he's done to the world. You know, we got, we got people like, brilliant young people like Nolan and everybody, these young people in the world, born into the world. Do we want them to go, in, go out into the world and be administrators? Of the, of the empire. We want young people coming out of college or I got these innovative ideas about creating, involved in, in being innovative and everything. We want them to do it within the same model, the structure that exists. No, I, my, my thought, if these kids want to take an action, and you're right, we need to take action. And what type of action can we take to bring the codes and in, in what Silesius talk about into being? One of the things we have to do, we have to start out with some principles, how we want to organize. How do we want to organize? You know, like if you want a small business, how do you want to organize that small business? Do you want to organize that small business around the same model of the banking system? Do you want to uh, 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 invent something to do some farming on the same model that exists? Do we want to start doing it? That's why for me, these codes and what Silesh is talking about is so important. You know, we all need money. Definitely, I have a small business. I, if I don't have money, I'll perish. Uh, I, I'm, I live in this type of world. You know, I have a small business. I do service for people. And sometimes, you know, I have to charge for the service. And I don't feel good about charging for the service. But I know if I don't charge for the service, my electricity is going to get shut off. I'm not going to be able to support my family. I know that. So, we have to have, we have to be thinking, how are we going to transition out of that for young people coming up? You know, I'm, I'm on my way out. You know, I'm 68 years old. I'm transitioning out. But for my grandchildren, for everybody that's coming up, I would like for them to have a, a way to think, a way to see the world, how they organize their thinking. And this is, what, if you're Christian, if you're Muslim, if you're Buddhist or whatever, they have taught you how to organize your thinking. So when you see something, you're thinking within that framework, with that, that consciousness, whether you know it or not, it's, it's in your DNA of your thinking. And what Shelley and what Salash do for me, if we could put that DNA in our thinking, these young people, when they're coming out in the world, uh, get ready to innovate or get married or build a family. If you have, that's how you put it into action on the everyday level you know uh, every day you put into action every day how you live your life when you get up in the morning the code uh, aspire to do no harm am i is that how i'm living today have i tried to hustle jackie my dear friend you know how i aspire to do my neighbor the cats the dog is that how I'm, that's how you put it into action every day 
through everyday transaction. It's transactional. Everyday transaction, inspired to do no harm. Uh, honor, protect, and restore the foundations of life. Am I doing that today uh, by food, uh, uh, um, how to get rid of stuff? Every, these are codes. Am I honoring, respecting, and restoring the foundations of life? Do I honor, protect indigenous people and their lands? And do I incorporate their wisdom, their counsel, and their systems of thinking, of science, into all affairs? See, how we do this every day on a minutia, am I saying the word? Minutia, minutia level. That's how you get the code. That's how you operationalize them. You can't operationalize them on a, 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 a right now on a, a centralized. They won't work on a centralized level. The codes do not work on a centralized level. What Silesh is talking about uh, 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 moving to uh, a money system, what they call it, uh, I forget this word that he used, where you don't have a, a, any centralized, like the central bank, this distributive money system, open open source system. You know, Bill Gates, the CIA, uh, 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 Federal Reserve, the central, they can't control this here stuff. This is the story I think that we should tell. If we tell this story and pound it home to look, everybody we meet, like I try to, we have to change the story. We have the life of the story. It's a narrative. And I don't care how informed or how aware we think we are, we're still trapped into this existence that we have been born, bred, and educated in and enculturated in for 68 years for myself, you know, for my Jack and my beautiful sister Jackie, for I ain't gonna tell, I ain't gonna tell. <laughs> and I don't know how old you folks are. This youngster over here, he ain't so brainwashed. He got a chance, he might be able to save us. Nolan might be able to save us. <laughs> Because he is not as brainwashed <laughs> as we are, you know. He hasn't been there. His synapses are not as, it's not as uh, 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 attached to the old as we are. This is why the military and everybody want to get young people. And they don't want, they don't want you coming into the military if you're 35. Man, hell no, you, you can't come in. We want to get them youngsters in here. This is why the university, they want to get the youngsters because they know they can mold the mind. And we. I think it, it would serve what we want to do so well. I like solar radiation. I've never heard that story until you start telling it. Never heard of it. It's a wonderful story. We need to tell that story. We need to tell that story. You know, this pandemic, I don't know if any of you guys saw on YouTube the pandemic of 1918. You know, that was during World War I. And what kicked World War I off was not because this here prince and got assassinated over in Bulgaria somewhere. What kicked off World War I was these Western powers divvying up Africa and they got into a squabble. That's what kicked it off, World War I. They got into a squabble. See, all wars, I don't care how they try to dress them up and glorify them, are based upon land. People trying to get the land because all the wealth was in the land. All the power was in the land. And World War I kicked off because those colonial powers, Germany, France, Britain, Bulgaria, they wanted the land. They were dividing up Africa. And they got, they got into a squabble and they kicked off World War I. What ended World War I, they won't tell you, was, I'm going to call it what it was, not the Spanish flu. It was called a swine flu that came out of Canada. That's what ended World War I. They won't tell that. It ended because it was more people dying from that swine flu than, the, than been killed by bullets, far more. That's what ended World War I. They don't want to tell that story. I, I highly encourage everyone to look at that and look at that and see what we're going through right now right now is he say here three don't receive peter self no but it's parallel and this global economy that we live in now um the way we can travel and take things 
you know, travel around, interconnect with each other is more, is greater now than it was even during World War I. And it was spread in World War I from Kansas to around the world, sending these soldiers around the world to fight. So we have to tell, start telling a new story. And that's the most powerful thing that you could do. Everything that you and Jamie was telling you was saying, it was a story. It was a story. The life is a story. This is why everybody has a story. This is why, you know, there's a story about George Washington. But look at that story. This is just a horrific story of the betrayal of humanity, just the destruction of life, of the earth, plundering, rape, pillage, and everybody. The code in what Silesh, for me, and in, 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 in Dr. Um, Will Tuttle offered to me, is a story of how we can organize our life, organizational structure. The story that we can tell our friends, that we can have a conversation about minutia, things that you can do, action that I can take right now. And this very action that I'm taking right now is that I'm gonna ensure that every decision that I make is based on the consequences to the health of the whole system for seven generations to come. And that human and non-human stakeholders are represented and taken into account. We, I can do that. I can't change the government. The reason why I went vegan, I said, I want to fight these bastards. I said, I want to fight them. I don't know any way other to fight them, but with the fork. With the fork. That's why I went to vegan. I wanted to do something that's effective to fight this freaking system, this system of colonialism, speciesism, racism, the brutality that is putting down on people, have us divided among each other, have white people hating black people and fearing black people, black people fearing white people, Mexicans, native, black people, everybody hating each other. I wanted to fight that system. And the only way I knew I could fight when I met Salesh was going vegan. I said, that's it. I could fight these bastards. That's the way I could fight them. And that's why that's one of the reasons why I'm a vegan today. And I'm more committed to it than ever before. Because I want to fight them. So in addition to that, what Shelley has given to me is an organizational framework and a structure so I can share with people but what you can do today. No, you cannot change the USDA. You cannot mess with the FDA. We cannot uh, 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 overthrow Bezos and all those people, Fries and Kogers and Monsanto. But you know what you can do? You can aspire to do no harm. That's some powerful, powerful stuff. You can aspire to do no harm. And you can organize your thought, your actions, in your words in such a way that it's nourishing to the entire community of life. That's a powerful action that we can take right now, today, every minute of the day. That's how we can empower ourselves. That's why I like so much what Shelly has put down. How each individual, and Shelly always talk about micro level. Bam, not macro, what you could do on the right here in the community, individually, and you don't need the government, you don't need a leader, and she talked about what we can really, really do right now today. Silesh talked about what we can now. What Silesh and them talking about? I know they're still working on the corn, the the, the Aquarius corn. Man, I told Silesh, I want to be the first one to put my money in the pot. When they're getting to call me up, I want to brag to my grandchildren. But I put my money in there before everybody. You get enough people put it. Uh, was it a hundred and one dollars in there? We we can make we can be effective. We can be effective. So we we want to we want to uh, uh, feed the world. We want to make some lot of change. But if we get this here, this this here uh, 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 the seventh principle shifting from a money driven economy to a service driven economy, all the other shifts that we want to make from normalized violence to normalized nonviolence. You know, from death and cruelty to animals, to love for animals, 
uh, from veganism, you know, from uh, uh, from uh, uh, um, disease and division to to um, veganism and radical equality, all those shifts will fall into play. Will just fall into play once we change this thing about money. As I said, I have my own business, and I feel bad. I, I but I have to take the money. If I don't, I will perish. I, I support a family. I got two daughters and six grandchildren, and I help them a lot, and I help myself. You know, I, I, I take care of a lady. She's like a mother to me. Uh, she's not my biological mother, but she's been in my life since uh, uh, I think I was about 11 years old. My father and her were once uh, lovers, but they eventually became just very, very good friends. She's a part of the family. She is uh, uh, nearly 80 years old, and the government gives her a measly 600 and something dollars, about $700 a month and $15 a month in food stamps. So I support her. And if I didn't have this income coming in, I couldn't, I couldn't support, I wouldn't have money to support her. And that, that's bothersome for me. So, you know, we can take actions every day to bring the codes into it. And there are very powerful action orientated principles that we can organize our lives around. And I think it's just so important that we are conscientious and aware of the, the power of the code and what Silesh has, has put down. I don't admire Silesh because he was this here engineer guy who do all that, did that stuff. I, I praise over Silesh because that shit he put down since he had climbing healers. You know, that, that's what, that's what made me say, man, this, this the man, this, this, this guy's team I want to be in, be on. I want to be on this guy's team. Because the stuff that he put down, because I, I think it, 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 it really gets to the root, the, the root cause of our problem. We have to root it out and start with something new. And I love what Buck Minister said, that you got to give people a new tool. And that's what the Aquarius uh, model to give a new tool. That's what the codes give people a new tool. And that's what we need, new tools. So we can, we do have the power. We can take action today, right now. I have grandchildren. I tried, I share these codes with my, with my two daughters and with my grandchildren, but my daughters, one of them fights it like crazy. She think it's insane. She think that <laughs> first thing she go to, well, you can't eat. How are you going to survive on it there? Well, sweetheart, I'm not saying you're going to change the system, but how you change your individual life right now what you can do to put these codes into existence so that your children, we don't want them to go out and get an education and become the manager at some place, going to the bank, get them MBA and going to the bank. So what? You got your MBA and you're working in the bank. You're just in another ministry. You're just doing the same thing that the, you thought that the bank was a horrible place. You thought that a Walmart, you thought these companies horrible place. Now you're in there and you're doing it. You, you you muted there, Melvin. Yeah, I went I went mute. Okay, gotcha. So um so you've got some really powerful stuff to say here, Melvin. And um what I'd like to uh, ask you is, would you like to lead a conversation about the codes for a healthy Earth and everything you're talking about? Um, and the reason I ask is if you'd like to. Um, I mean, I believe in the codes as well. And um, what I organize as the agenda for this meeting is a specific tool. So like you're, you mentioned Buckminster Fuller, who said, don't try to change people's minds. Yeah. Give them a tool. Okay. Wow. So what I'm focused on here on this meeting, what I'd like to suggest we focus on is a specific tool that I that we're calling um, Operation Stone Soup. Oh, okay. I got that. I got that. Yeah. And so, um, but that's a separate conversation. 
from the codes, right? Mm -hmm. And the codes is a great conversation to have. So what I'd like to offer, if you would like to lead a conversation on the codes and just go deep into that, what I'd like to offer is to create a breakout room and then anyone who wants to join you in a conversation about the codes for a healthy earth uh, can do that. If you'd like, I can, I can set that up for you. And Melvin, you're, you're muted, you're muted. Melvin, can you hear me, Melvin? Thumbs up if you can hear me, thumbs down if you can't. Okay, if you can hear me, you are muted, so no one can hear you when you're, okay, go ahead. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay, you're, you're muted again, okay. Melvin. You... Okay, it's saying I'm muted now. Can okay. you hear me? We, we can hear you now, yes. Yeah, I definitely want to take you up on that, but not right at this time. I definitely want to take, and my intention was just to come in and listen <laughs> and learn. Not to run my mouth. I definitely will take you up on that. Okay. Well, whenever you want, just just let me know. Thank you. Um, and because the way I see it, like if if Buckminster Fuller were alive today, right? And you presented him with the codes for a healthy earth, right? I think he would probably agree. Right. And then um, I think per his quote, don't try to change people's minds, give them a tool, right? So I think, I don't think you'd see Buckminster Fuller just handing out leaflets, pamphlets on codes for a healthy earth and saying, hey everybody, I'd like to change your mind, please read this. I think he would probably be focused on a tool that could change people more than a document. Now, I love codes for a healthy earth. I love every single principle within it, right? And that's inspired me to do what I'm doing right now today, which is talking about and sharing about and creating a tool called Operation Stone Soup. And so for me, there is no, you know, fundamental disagreement between Codes for a Healthy Earth and Operation Stone Soup. They're, they couldn't, as far as I'm concerned, they couldn't be more consistent and supportive of each other. So um, in that spirit, um, let me let me screen share and continue going through the last of the document. Um, so I've talked about the four um, kind of pillars of feeding everyone, eradicating pandemics, going super intelligent, and cooling and cooling the planet um, as kind of the four core um, action items of Operation Stone Soup. And then in this new story for humanity, I was gonna go on to say that once we accomplish those four things, feeding everyone, eradicating pandemics, going super intelligent and cooling the planet, accomplishing those four things will make it infinitely easier for humanity to wrap our collective minds and hearts around all of the other problems and opportunities left for us to address. Um, in a holistic context. And so I look at those four as four foundational pillars, um, which are vital for, for, for saving life on earth. And I'm suggesting that the moment when we, this is kind of like, standing in the future looking backward and saying the moment when we wrapped our collective minds and hearts around these four pillars went down in history as the single most important and, impact and impactful inflection point ever experienced by humanity, perhaps second only to the agricultural revolution, 
with a nod to all of its lasting impacts, which we're living under and suffering under today. Um, and that, again, standing in the future, looking back, we'd say prior to that point in time, when we really got that we need to do this, and there was a tool launched to facilitate it that so essentially became like a self-replicating tool, which I think this can become once we start in one city um, and eradicate hunger in that city with plant-based foods, that city becomes a tool in, in that it is an example that the rest of the world can, um, can learn from and watch. That's why I'm proposing that we do a press conference so that we can properly launch this tool, this tool kit. It's like a Swiss army knife, right? With four main, you know, implements. Feeding everyone, eradicating pandemics, going super intelligent through collective super intelligence, and cooling the planet through SRM. I'm suggesting that if we launch a press conference where we make all that explicit and say we're starting right here in one city, right? Just like the stone soup story started with one pot filled with water and one stone. And they said, we're starting here. This is the starting point. That's one of the things I love most about that story, Stone Soup, is that it puts the emphasis on the starting point, making it public and visible. They didn't do it outside of town 10 miles away. They did it right in the middle of the town square, right? And so what I'm suggesting is that if we launch Operation Stone Soup in a very public way in one city, one specific city, Hey, sweetheart, welcome, Melissa. Um, then we can get the attention of the entire world. Like President Vicente Fox and I did with regard to ending the prohibition of drugs and ending the violence caused by that prohibition, we can do a similar press conference and impress upon the world that there is a new tool out there and we're gonna make it work in this one city for starters. And we invite everyone to watch and we invite everyone to participate. And once we've eradicated hunger, once we've, del once we've delivered food to everyone in that one city and it's working, I think everyone's gonna want that tool. I think every city in the world is gonna to want to feed everyone using whole food, plant-based foods and thus eradic eradicate the, uh, not just this present pandemic, but all pandemics, because we'll now have the tool to prevent people from getting sick. The tool that will enable people to stay home when they need to. Let's say over the course of the next decade, there's three other major pandemics. Whenever a pandemic hits, we've got to go into lockdown and we need the mechanisms to feed everyone if we want to survive. And we're in such a critical state right now because the economy is collapsing. So people don't have the work that they had before. They can't make the money. And if they can't make money, how are they going to feed themselves? And that's a recipe from a Mad Max world, a world of violence, a world of conflict in which it's going to be vastly more difficult to get anything done. I'm saying, let's just not go there. Let's not go the route of starvation and violence. Let's go the route of implementing a tool that will end hunger and malnutrition and end pandemics in one fell swoop. And I believe that'll get the attention. Look, if somebody, if there was a, a news announcement that there's a group that's gonna feed everyone in Louisville and Louisville, Kentucky and deliver food to their homes on an ongoing basis, I'd be like, who the heck are these people? Who's funding them? What is this, a church? What's, what's going on, right? It's definitely gonna get my attention. And as I look in and then I see, whoa, this is not just about feeding people and ending hunger. This is about collective super intelligence and spreading this mechanism, this tool, all around the world with our collective intelligence. 
and it also includes cooling the planet. It's like, whoa, these folks are hitting some major checkboxes. And I would say to the world at the press conference in which, at which we announce all this, I would say, I'd like to put out a challenge to all of humanity. Does anyone have a better tool than what we're suggesting here? Does anyone have a better Swiss army knife that will end hunger in this city right now, end the pandemics, right? And bring humanity together as a collective superintelligence so that we can solve all of our problems, including cooling the planet in time. Does anyone have a better tool? If you do, we'll recycle everything we've done and go with yours. But we need a tool to solve our problems. Right now, we don't have one. We have neither a tool nor a plan to solve our problems. We have a fragmented humanity. Everyone's doing what they can to either survive or if they're a rich sociopath to increase their wealth, increase how much they've hoarded, they're hoarding away from everyone else. See, that's the sick psychopathic sociopathic game that's been beaten into us from the time we were born. Yes, Jackie. So um, I'm not really certain how we're kind of recruiting or if we have a solid city like Louisville, that's exactly where we're starting. But I just wanted to share that I was, um, uh, I'm part of the steering committee for the Interfaith Vegan Coalition and I was watching the last uh, meeting and Frank Lane was talking about how he had just visited Sedona and how they started this new initiative where they no longer, and with people there, they no longer interested in having the reputation of Sedona be the spiritual location. They want it to be a vegan location. They want it to be a vegan destination. And they're talking about actively um, doing that. So of course my ears were, I was like, compassion games. So I reached out to Silesh and he said, sure, go ahead and invite them um, to compete. But then he said to invite them to the block party Friday. So I'm gonna do that, invite them to the block party on Friday. But when I hear things like that, I was just like, do, do we just invite them? Is that something, because it's Sedona, it doesn't exactly fit into the model of what we're doing because of eradicating the hunger or feeding every, so I just wanted to know like, with that information, what do we do with it? Oh yeah, well, first of all, by default, everyone is invited to the block party and to the solution club, right? The only caveat is to play by the rules and there are some folks who don't and so they can't come back, at least for the time being. But other, but short of that, which is obvious, everyone's invited, right? I don't care if you're a Sedona or, you know, any or whatever, right? Whatever organization, whatever place you're coming from, you're welcome at the Collective Intelligence Block Party. And, you know, what we're doing at these meetings, at this one right here, right now, and at the Block Party, is we are getting it on. We're getting it on. Not in a bad way, in a good way, in a very good way. We're saying, all right, here's a proposal for a tool. Here's the idea. Do you like it? You have a better idea, a better tool? What you got? We're getting it on and we're gonna keep getting it on until we have something that quite simply makes everyone stand up and cheer and say, that's it, that's it. I'm in, let's do it. Go ahead, Melissa. Go for it. Um, Jackie has a really interesting um, point. Um, given that vegans are already in a zone of compassion and have made self personal sacrifices to their lifestyles, in a compassionate lifestyle, um, it would be interesting to invite them, Jackie. Um, and me, and um, I don't, I'm trying to look for another word but to use. Um, so invite, I'm gonna use the word invitation to the vegan collective to become the tip of the spear for change. 
because vegans are already moving that direction. So I think it would be very valuable to have them contribute. Um, what I'm seeing, I don't want to be negative, but what I'm seeing is this polarization happening very dramatically around us, where there's a splitting of the paths. Um, there are people who are really trying to hold on to the old system, and they're trying to hoard as much as they can and profit as much as they can from the coronavirus. Um, I've had an experience this morning very much about, you know, um, around this where people or saying do the things this way because you could make a lot of money and I'm so I'm like well that's not my style and that's not what it's all about what I'm doing what we are doing is is about change and transformation to, to create something that's a value and that's that's teaching good lessons it's not about the making of money it's and and so I think Whoever we can invite who's about this new way of being in the world and doing things valuable. Um, so I'm seeing that happening. People hoarding, people, you know, on this ego trip. And then there's the opposite path, which like ourselves, is the path of the heart, which is endeavoring to do things in a collective way that is also loving, creative, co-creative, and sharing all the, the wealth found us and making sure that we're not hurting the planet in the process of whatever it is we're doing. So I, I wanted to encourage and it's just kind of an interesting thought too. You know, I think we we keep coming back to the vegan group. <laughs> Interestingly, you know. Uh, so something to think about, Jamin and all. Yeah, you know, in fact, um, veganism is a tool which is bringing all of us together in, in a way that's totally opened up my heart to a whole new world that's possible that I didn't, I just wasn't tapped into before. And so for me, um, Operation Stone Soup is an outgrowth, direct outgrowth out of veganism. and the desire to end hunger and malnutrition, right? And the desire and imperative to go super intelligent. And none of these are inconsistent. So it's kind of like all these positive forces are coalescing, right? And I think coalescence is a, is a really key thing, theme for us to, to meditate on. Um, because, um, you know, there are lots of great ideas, great principles, great writings, great this, great that. There's lots of great stuff out there. And what do we got? We got 7.7 .7 billion people who are, for the most part, totally fragmented and separate from each other. And um, I believe that... Um, to the extent Operation Stone Soup gets off the ground and goes somewhere, it will be because a critical mass of us coalesced around it and said, yes, let's do that. Let's not just talk about it and forget it. Let's actually, let's talk about it and then let's do it, right? That requires a coalescence, requires a critical mass of people coalescing around it and committing to it, right? Now, what if Operation Stone Soup is not the great idea? What if it has some fundamental flaws and it's just not, not, eh, okay, something else? There will be something that we will coalesce around, that a critical mass of, of us will coalesce around. I talk about the 1% most dialed in, most awake, including uh, the 12 of us who are on this call. Um, now, imagine that 1% of humanity, 80 million people, right? And imagine that um, a portion of them coalesces around one strategy, another portion coalesces around a different strategy, another coalesces around a different strategy. I would hope that through the application of collective intelligence and conversations like we're having here, 
these different groups would be able to discuss the different strategies and hopefully build towards a consensus, or if not an outright consensus, a critical mass of this 1% most dialed in, not the 1% wealthiest. In fact, I think there's practically zero overlap between the two groups, <coughs> the two 1%. Uh, I'm talking about the most dialed in and creative. Um, all right, Melvin, looks like you need to take off for now. And great to see you. Thanks for being here and come back anytime. We will be here until about seven o'clock today. Good to see you, Melvin. Thanks, Melvin. All right, we'll see you soon. So um, just imagine that we're able to get a critical mass coalescing around one strategy and then actually giving that strategy a real go. So um, uh, anyway, coalescence. I I'm going to go on mute because I'd love to hear other people's thoughts. Um, I'm just wondering, um, like, am I hearing some doubt around the idea of the stone soup project or am I just, I'm coming in later on in the conversation and I'm just missed parts of the conversation? Um, because it seems to me that we just have to select one idea and just go for it and stop you know, stop this dialoguing around, well, if someone has a better idea, you know, a lot of people are going to have a lot of good ideas that they're, because it's going to take all of us and lots of operations to write things or change, transform things. So I'm just wondering, well, if we are all a group on this collective um, platform, whether it's the Solution Club or Block Party, what is the idea people want to join in together here to see through. Is it stone soup? Because that's where I thought all the logs, that fire the logs were going right now. So if you could just catch me up to speed on that, that would be awesome. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I spent about an hour and a half kind of going over the document that I'd sent out last night, all centered around Operation Stone Soup. Um, and then um, Melvin spoke for about half an hour about the codes for a healthy earth, um, you know, by Shelley Ostroff and Jan and all that and, and, and Silas's core principles. And he was really making a strong case for all of that. Um, and um, that, um, you know, th there seemed to be, it felt to me like there was an element of, hey, instead of Operation Stone Soup, I really think this is what we need to focus on, right? The codes for a healthy earth. And so I suggested that we could actually have both, right? We can believe in and support and develop the codes for a healthy earth and implement a specific project largely supported by those codes. And that kind of got me off onto thinking, well, shoot, you know, what, you know, what do people want? Right? Am I just all alone here thinking? I, of course, I don't think I'm all alone here with this Operation Stone Soup. But first, first of all, it wasn't even my idea um, to start it, but we've all been pitching in. But I'm just like opening it up and saying, hey, look, if we're going to do it, let's concentrate and do it. But before we jump to that conclusion, maybe there's something better. So I'm just kind of opening it up and saying, hey, you know, what would people really like to get behind and support? If not that, what? If it is that, fine, let's do it. But I didn't want to skip that step, Melissa, and just presume that everyone's with me on this Operation Stone Soup thing. I just want to create some space and say, hey, if, the, if you got a different idea, out with it. Um, is it okay this back and forth right now? Does anyone object or can I just keep going for it? Please, please keep going. That's why we're here. Thumbs up if you're okay and thumbs down if you're not. Um, just kidding. Um, <clears throat> so um, my understanding from the last few meetings was that Silesh, John, and yourself, and a number of other people, Priya, Dr. Priya, 
were uh, very much engaged and getting involved in this idea of Operation Stone Soup. So um, I'm not quite sure where Melvin's coming from because I understood that it was also Silash's, Dr. Rao's intention to um, move forward with a project like this. Is that incorrect? Or so again, where is the hesitation around the project coming from? Well, I, I personally have no hesitation and what you articulated is consistent with my understanding about Silish and others. Um, Melvin had to step away, um, but uh, perhaps he could, whenever he has an opportunity, could speak to the hesitation. Or if anyone else has hesitation, please articulate that. But I have no hesitation around Operation Stone Soup. For me, it's as, it's as obvious as a firefighter busting into a burning house to save the children up in the attic, right? There's just, we, we, we got to do it. What the hell are we waiting for? That's where I'm coming from. Um, but I'm just me. So I'm going to go on mute. If anyone either has a better idea or can see something fundamentally flawed with Operation Stone Soup, or if you support it and you're like, hell yes, let's do it, you know, but something. So I'm going to go on mute until I hear a few somethings from a few people. Otherwise, I'm gonna. I'll just commit myself to the nearest insane asylum and and spend the the rest of my days there. So I'm just gonna add one more comment. So um, what I would suggest is that we ask, um, here's the project that we're moving forward on. Who has ideas of how to move it forward, and what are we missing? What contributions would any of you like to add, either in terms of ideas or actual actions? Thank you. Emery, go for it. Yeah, thanks, Jan. Uh, I put a comment uh, into the chat before, but I'll, uh, I just wanted to say that I, I feel uh, somewhat concerned that you know inevitably when <clears throat> we're in the process of creating this this delicious stone soup and uh you know we understand where that is leading leading us to to and uh, and we anticipate the the taste of the soup and and all of that you know inevitably there's going to be those who uh you know feel us they feel what, what what's what's going on but they still wish to bring a, a chicken to the soup you know and uh my my question is is that at, at that point do we throw out the soup or 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 can we find a way to push forward and still achieve a, a certain uh, amount of success with uh you know with the objectives that uh we have uh <clears throat> you know that, that we have um agreed on as being primary to solve you know as best as we can the the problems that the world is facing i mean do we throw out the suit because of the chicken, I mean, we really have to give that some deep, deep consideration, you know, I mean, we want everybody to chip in, right? But if that's what they've got is a chicken, you know, I mean, I, I, I just, I'm concerned. Can I ask a clarifying question, Emery, and that is, um, are you literally talking about someone showing up with a dead chicken and saying, hey, I'd like to add, or are you speaking metaphorically? I mean, like, what, what, what are you really saying? Well, kind of metaphorically, you know, just as we are kind of metaphorically talking about stones, you know, I mean, I don't anticipate anybody to, to actually eat uh, or, or, or consume the, 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 the an actual stone soup. However, there are some people in the world that do, you know, 
<laughs> crazy as that sounds, there are some people in the world that actually do uh, subsist. They, 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 they are able to live, you know, continue living on because they've consumed a stone soup. You know, that's real. Now, I mean, you're going to have some people that, you know, in our world are going to want to bring a chicken because, for whatever reason. That means because of cultural or whatever, you know, I don't know. We, can we stop people from bringing a chicken and putting a chicken into the soup? Really, that's the, that's the ultimate question, I guess. Well, for me, the answer is yes we can stop them from putting a chicken into the soup. If we have established that the rule is that the soup must be plant-based and a chicken is not a plant, then it's a very simple matter of saying, uh, no, thank you. That's my answer. Go, go ahead, Jack. So we throw out the soup. No, no, I'm not suggesting we throw out the soup. I'm suggesting that we prevent the person who wants to put a chicken in the soup we prevent that person from putting the chicken in the soup in the first place, precisely so that we don't have to throw out the soup. How do you do that? Um, How do you, the ways and means of separation from the collective of those people. How do you dis disregard or to put them aside and and not include them in any way. You know, even though on other levels, they may want to and have the heart also to contribute in other ways. You know, let's say, let's say, I mean, there's a concern for other things that, that they're able to uh, add to, to the solution. You know, I mean, I guess you'd have to evaluate that a little more deeply, right? Well, I mean, like if someone shows up here on the Solution Club who's a committed carnivore and they want to help save life on Earth, um, I would posit that there is a conversation where, where I could see them plugging in, which might be, you know, a conversation where carnivores and vegans get together and talk about it and share about it. You know, what facts and data can you bring to this conversation that, you know, argue in favor of carnivorism? You know, now, Jackie and I might not choose to participate in that conversation. We might choose to participate in this one instead, the one about Operation Stone Soup. This is, look, I, I'm beyond that discussion of whether or not to kill animals and eat them. I'm, I'm just beyond it. Uh, and I want to implement stone soup. Jackie and I could go to the stone soup conversation and the others who wanted to go to the vegan versus carnivore, um, they can have that conversation. So, and that's, that, that gets to the essence of collective superintelligence, which is that it's a network of conversations. It's not just one conversation. And so when, when Melvin was going on for about half an hour about the codes for a healthy earth, I finally said, look, you know, do you want to lead a conversation about that? Because we can create a space for that. And then those who want to be in that conversation can do that. Totally respectfully. And those who want to talk about Operation Stone Soup can do that. So it's basically let all these flowers bloom. It's not one conversation. It's infinite conversations. Well, I, I, I get it. You know, I, I understand. You know, I, I just... I, I see the goal and, and, and part of the objective is to try to, to change people who, you know, they're ingrained, you know, into their life, a certain lifestyle that, you know, has to be explained to them to, to show them how detrimental that is. And, and you have to be, that's a delicate walk, you know, to be able to reach a point where they're willing to talk about it and not shut you out and not want to participate in, 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 in that uh, discussion. Uh, for what, you know, for reasons that are a little bit hard to uh, 
to understand, perhaps, but um, given the fact that they would be able to discuss that, you know, in, a, in this kind of a setting, the exposure itself could be a positive thing for changing that attitude and that point of view and that way of life. So, you know, uh, how do we in include, be, be as inclusive as possible? possible? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think that's where collective superintelligence comes in because it is radically inclusive. Everyone is included, everyone is welcome. Here are all the conversations that are happening. Find the conversation you'd like to plug into and plug in, be a part of it, be included. Have your voice heard and hear from others right? The, the big vision of collective superintelligence is that by coming together and organizing ourselves into this network of conversations, that we can get to the truth. The truth of what is good, the truth of what is right, the truth of what we must do if we want to walk that righteous path. I like that. I like that. You know, you want to, you want to walk a righteous path and to do the most constructive possible thing that's going to you know ensure the best results for what we need to do so i like that and uh you know hopefully hopefully we can you know find those extra rooms there where uh, it'll be led by people of uh, strong enough conviction to you know precipitate a change in people who are willing to enter into that into that discussion, you know. Uh, hope, hoping for the best. That's all. I'm complete, like Steve says. All right, awesome. Jackie's had her hand up for quite a while. Thanks for your patience, Jackie. Go for it. Um, I just wanted to respond to Imri about two things about the inclusion, because veganism, that's the most radically inclusive way of being. It's just innately, it's radically inclusive. Not We can't eat like everyone else, but everyone can eat like us. I think also about people that want to contribute have to be aligned with what we're doing. We have nothing to lose. We have nothing to gain except love. And I'm not about changing anyone. Maybe there may be other people in the group that are um, those kind of fighters in confrontation, but I'm not about fighting. I'm not about changing anyone. To me, this I love this idea. I'm complete in. And to me, this is love. I, but I'm not going to force my love on people. This is about love. This is about healing. This is about we know what we're doing to be right. We know and we have the science. So if people want to come and put chicken in the soup, that's what we have Dr. Pri and her team <laughs> to address those things. As long as we stay aligned with our mission. But again, my message is not about, I'm not trying to change anyone. I am trying to help. I'm trying to pour love on you, but I'm not gonna fight you to let me love you. So I will move on to someone else that's looking for that love and that healing and those answers. And that, like I said, there may be some of us that have that language better, but that's, at least that's not me. To me, this is a, a huge transformation about helping and healing. That's not about that dominating about your thinking, because to me, that's judgment. We're trying to change people. We first have to tell me you're wrong and we're right. And I'm just not about that. I'm about showing the evidence, being in truth, and sharing love. Jackie, that is so awesome what you just said. I totally right there with you, sister. You know, I think that is, I could not, I, you just said it perfectly. It's about finding the people who are in, whose words and actions are in, in uh, alignment with compassion and being uh, acting in loving ways and um, that's what we're doing so we just need to find those organizations and people who are in alignment with us and work co-creatively together with them thank you Jackie that was beautiful awesome welcome Ugo and yeah, great stuff, Jackie. And and that, you know, and really that's the essence of collective superintelligence is find wherever you want to be, right? Like, so literally within collective superintelligence, if there was a whole community that was like pro-carnivorism and 
We think we've got the facts and how to do it. And we've got Alan Savory here. What, what, great. Organize all the meetings you want and let everyone in, right? Because I believe that if we, as we embrace, as humanity embraces dialogue, conversation, actual conversations like what we're doing right here, right now, not some Fox News anchor who just interrupts their own guests and gives them 30 second sound bites. And if they repeat, you know, the Republican conventional wisdom that socialism is bad and, and da 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 and this and that and the military is the way, whatever, right? That's not what's happening here, obviously, <laughs> right? But if we embrace a radically inclusive um, culture of actual conversations where we actually talk about what really matters, then um, I believe what will happen is that those conversations that are closest to the truth and to a really awesome path forward, people will tend to congregate around those. And bad ideas will probably attract fewer people, right? So, you know, though I'm not too crazy about marketplaces, you could think of it as a marketplace of ideas, a marketplace of conversations. And people go where they want to go. I believe if we have that freedom, and if we have that flexibility that people can jump from conversation to conversation, and we have this radical inclusivity, I believe that humanity as a whole, we will find our true north. As, as Hugo and Jackie and Mayra and I like to say in Spanish, hablando se entiende la gente. This is the way that we understand each other is by talking, right? And we basically need an upgrade in the technology and tools and culture of talking, right? Where have we gotten in the last 200 years? We're sitting at home yelling at our television set, right? <laughs> and, you know, um, occasionally getting out on the street and protesting one thing or another. When what we need is dialogue, we need this. So here we are today. I organized a meeting about Operation Stone Soup. Those who are interested showed up and we're having a conversation. Perfect case study. Now Operation Stone Soup is in the running. And what I'm proposing is there might be a bunch of other ideas that are in the running. Let's get it on. Let's have the race. Let's have the compassion games to find out which is the best plan, which is the best strategy. What's the best model? What's the best story? Right? And so for me, collective superintelligence is like this laissez-faire giant bazaar where you have all kinds of merchants of ideas, manufacturers of ideas, right? Consumers of ideas, all just buzzing around and trading and you know, I'm, I'm going to use the metaphor of buying and selling, but there's no money, obviously. No one had to pay to get into this room. No one has to pay to stay here. No one has to pay to leave, <laughs> right? So, but I'm just using market, marketplace as a metaphor. So just imagine this giant baz bazaar of conversations. And we're all swapping, trading, exchanging, listening to gifting ideas, thoughts, models, right? And, you know, my faith is that out of all the commotion and dust and noise and clanging and donkeys taking a dump here and there of the bazaar, <laughs> right, sorry for all the color, but that out of all the chaos of the bazaar, the best ideas will rise to the top. Like, and the visual I, I'm, I'm now thinking of is like those human towers in Barcelona, right, where they just stand on top of each other and just go up and up and up right? We might see in this massive bazaar of tens of thousands of people, a few human towers popping up saying, wow, we believe 
that we believe in these ideas so much that we're standing for them, we're supporting them, and we're letting other people stand on our shoulders. What a great conversation because we're, 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 we keep, we, we keep approaching this from multiple different levels. All right. We've been in this meeting for a little over three hours now. I'd like to propose a little break. How long of a break would people like? I'm thinking like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20. What would people like? Just hold up a number of, or just speak up however many minutes you'd like. I'd like 15. Okay. Ugo says 15. Jackie's got a thumb up. I'd say we've got preliminary consensus around 15. I'm going to stop recording and then we'll start a new recording when I get back.